Hey everybody, it's Dominic Gergiev from The Break It Down Show and today's guest is Dan Fraser. Dan is back on The Break It Down Show discussing the fascinating nature of Old West history. The characters and tales we know are retold repeatedly, which backs who are the forgotten heroes. P.D. Turner has been reading a number of histories, most recently Jerome Preisler's Civil War Commando, the story of William Cushing. So today we talk to John about what places, what battles, what characters are out there that need our attention. Dan also runs the Texas Center at Schreiner University in Texas. Their efforts at the Texas Center are leading the way as Texas grows over the next 50 years. If you want to support the Breaking Down Show, go to BreakingDownShow.com and donate to the PayPal link. You can also subscribe to any podcast platform. You can buy our merch or you can watch our videos for free on YouTube. Go to Save the Brave, SaveTheBrave.org, support our veteran tribe. Here comes Don Fraser. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Moran. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, I'm Don Frazier, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Man, happy new year, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, first show of the new year. And we were already talking about, so I'm fascinated by these guys that get left behind by history. Sometimes forgotten guys get picked up and, and become something. We know about Wyatt Earp. We know all these different characters. You know, Chamberlain up in Little Round Top. Sure. I just read a book by Jerome Preisler called uh, The Civil War Commando. And it's about this guy, Will C- Cushing, who is just the ultimate risk taker and makes like, he makes I don't know, commander in the Navy at like 19 or something ridiculous. Oh, they all did. I mean, Civil War is full of a bunch of very violent teenagers. Yeah. This guy was insane. He's like, that seems like I might die. I'm going headlong into it. He doesn't graduate from Annapolis, even though he makes it all four years. They're like, you're going to be a bad officer. But. (laughs) <laughs> he ha- he managed to time his getting kicked out of West or of, of Annapolis with the beginning of the Civil War and like half of the Navy officers leaving. And so he got to sneak in the back door. And because he was, I mean, gosh, it's more it's not enough to say audacious, right? Yeah. He was he was insane, this guy. Well, he was I think that they, criminal. It might have been the boldness of youth. Uh the older I get, the more cautious I get. I mean, I even have started walking gingerly down the walk so I don't fall and break something. Oh, you know, boy. when I was a little kid, I'd have gone down there on a bicycle at breakneck speed and jumped over stuff. And, you know, then as a teenager, I would have been a little more circumspect, but I would have been trying to impress a girl. Now I'm just trying to stay out of the ER. <laughs> I used to do this thing where I would go downstairs. I'd put my chest over my feet and just relax my, my feet. And let my ankles just actuate down the stairs. I could go down the stairs ridiculously fast. Now my ankles don't even move that fast. I would just, I would just there'd be traction die. involved. You're right. Yeah, traction, casts, surgeries, metal plates, all that kind of stuff. What, so, who are some of your um, favorite people? And and when I think about this too, there's like um, in John Langler's book about Powhatan and Clark, just an incredible book. So many letters that he got to get into. And and so much of it survives that he was able to really put something together. Same thing with Will Cushing. There's so much letter writing back then. And yeah. these guys, even though they were very bold, I mean, there's an argument to be made that that Powhatan Clark is one of the greatest horsemen of his era in the United States military, right? But yeah. last in his class at West Point. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, we like that. Yeah. <laughs> there's always the story of that guy in the back of the classroom that ends up inventing something that's you know life changing. Yeah. And uh, so just sometimes your academic uh, resume doesn't indicate your future uh, contribution. You know, there was a bunch of guys that graduated first of their class in West Point that amounted to absolutely nothing. Right. And right. when the, the time of uh, crisis came, they just folded up. And so uh, it, it's tough to to quantify and get your arms around that internal character uh, that is within so many of the, the human species. But there are a million stories that go untold and underreported 
primarily because you know you've got a finite amount of material right. that you can put between boards for instance so if you're going to write a book you got to hit the highlights as a matter of course unless you can find enough material to tell a particular story well mm. uh, that will actually fill up 200 300 manuscript pages um so it's uh that's tough if people don't leave the material behind then you can't write their story and uh one of the things the the big debates that were that's always going on in the history world is well these people are underrepresented in history and these people's story isn't told but if they didn't tell their own story it's tough for us to pick it up as historians and you end up being in a position of almost speculating well, had they written this down, had they given this account, this is what they would be about. Well, that's not history. That's just storytelling. So um, the, the good news about working in the Civil War is there's a lot of people that wrote stuff down. It's a very literate uh, society, literate time in American history. I want to stay on this topic because it's interesting to me. Uh, one of the things that Jerome does is he writes fiction for a living, right? And he is yeah. not a historian. Although he has written, he wrote about um, Jack McNeese and like the actual Dirty Dozen. That yeah. all kinds of you know they guys these guys were the pathfinders that jumped in before the paratroopers. Correct. Insane. Um, this guy at one point during the Battle of the Bulge, they finally get a microscopically short weather window where they can fly in from England, and they're like, "All right, Jack, when you and your guys jump, everybody bring black smoke for cancel the mission to provision the army down there." And then um, bring orange smoke, and we'll start dropping supplies. And so Jack looks at all his guys and says, orange smoke only. You yeah. Know? Because he's like, there's no, there's no way we're failing at this, you know? No, there, there's no second best on this one. We got to be on top of it. Yeah. Right, right, right. Not a lot of stories about these guys, though. I mean, he wrote the book. Jeremy wrote the book. And I guess the thing I'm asking is just he is – a nonfiction and a fiction writer. He's not a historian. How yeah. bound is he to uh, history and, and how much license does he get to tell the story in a way that's narrative and is storytelling, but also it's in compelling. Yeah, no, I, I, I've struggled with that. So I actually wrote a, a full length play on a bet. And uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that I kept struggling with is I wanted to be absolutely hide bound to the history. But the problem is history does not happen uh, neatly as a three-act play. And there's long periods of stuff where nothing much happens, and that doesn't make for compelling drama. So you end up having to take um, license. And as long as you're up front that, hey, this is a work of fiction, this is not a work of documentary, get after it. Um, you know, I'm reminded, uh, I, saw, I had a chance to work with Phil Collins. I can't remember if I ever mentioned that to you. Mm -mm. All right, so Phil Collins, you know, Genesis fame, drummer, extraordinaire, British rock god, calls me one day and says that um, he has this secret habit, <laughs> and his secret habit is collecting Alamo artifacts. Wow. So I said, my gosh, you know, Phil, how did you get involved in that? And he said, well, I was watching The Wonderful World of Disney, and I watched Fess Parker play Davy Crockett. And so while that was a fictionalized account of Davy Crockett, it ended up being the gateway for Phil's obsession with the Alamo and history and Texas history, which is odd for a kid from Chiswick. You know, it's a suburb of London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, really well done historical fiction can be just the bait you need uh, to suck the folks into <laughs> a lifetime of being history appreciators. Now, then, the, the downside of being a historian is I'm I'm the worst guy to watch a movie with. That's uh, some sort of historical, you know, tale. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I pick it apart. I'm having a real hard time, uh, you know, with series like 1883, the prequel to Yellowstone, and things like that. Uh, so, anyhow. I, I think that fiction has a role. Historical, good historical fiction has its place. Uh, but I also would like, especially out there in Hollywood, that's a little closer to your zip code, uh, to at least talk to historians and get the, the setting right if they can. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, small quibble. And then I wanted to go back to your, if you write it down, we can help tell the story. 
when we look back far enough into history, we start to only be able to tell the story with with old earthen baking ovens and shards yeah. of, of stones and bones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, hey, they had combs for their hair, you know, and then you start to put the story together because they didn't really write much down. And when we do find something, it's this great treasure trove of things. Now we write everything down. But I don't know that really? that's better. Well, you know, history by definition is built around human generated documents. So if it has to do with stones and bones and pottery shards, that's anthropology. Okay. And what I always love about anthropologists is they'll say, well, this stone here and this stone here proves that they were worshipers of the winter solstice. Mm -hmm. Well, how exactly do you get from here to there with all that? It seems like there's an awful lot of speculation involved with that. But by the same token, we historians are interpreting what people wrote down. And a lot of times they wrote stuff down specifically so that they could leave a particular version for posterity, even though it may not have anything to do with the truth. So, you know, there's problems anytime you try to tell the human story, no matter what the evidence is, you're stacking up to tell it. If you took all of the accounts of the Battle of the Bulge from all sides and read, oh, yeah. you would read about a thousand different events. It wouldn't be the same thing, right? No, I mean, you've got a 15 degree either side, right or left field of view. And uh, when the, the round starts zipping in overhead and the, the smoke starts rolling across the battlefield, it's anybody's guess on what you're experiencing. I, I like Stephen Crane's Red Bla Badge of Courage because he just throws the Battle of Chancellorsville as a huge abstraction and uh, talks about the, the sun hanging in the sky like a big red wafer. And I'm like, you know, that's a pretty good way to describe the sun on a smoky battlefield. Yeah. Uh, but somebody that's writing a letter home to Ma is not going to say, well, the, hung, the, the sun hung over the battlefield like a big red communion wafer. You know, they're just not going to. Yeah. Oh, I don't know if you can hear the... They're apparently doing the yard work here between the right. You heard that. We're just going to keep on trucking along. It, all right, it's good. Somewhat there, but Dicky, uh, Dicky's a buddy of mine. He watch, watches the show all the time. Says um, U.S. formal history is largely fiction. How much do you agree with that? Well, Henry Ford said history, all history is bunk, mm -hmm. and so uh, there is certainly uh, interpretation that varies. So. Whether or not it's completely fiction, I'm not sure I buy that. But is there ways that history is manipulated or that some evidence is suppressed or some evidence is weighted one way over another? Absolutely. And I think that's always going to be the case with any human endeavor. I mean, my gosh, I'm an hour away from the Alamo. You want to talk about interpretation and whether or not it's fiction or not, man, that is the center of the universe for that. Yeah, yeah. We, um, yeah, <laughs> and I want to get into that a little bit, but I also want to couple, cover a couple of the things. Uh, if I was to write my biography, which at some point I'm going to write something like that about the modern wars, yeah, um, I'm going to do my best not to make myself look like a superhero, but I was in a very unique position where I got to see and experience the war as units rolled past me, right? And so I'd watch yeah. them make the same mistakes. And sure. so I can see awfully omnipotent and i'm kind of bound by my ability to write because i'm not you know look you can only be so good of a writer it's a complex thing to begin with it requires so much context and then your editor is like hey by the way not someone a 750 page book of you rambling let's tighten this thing to 300 pages correct and so 500 years from now if someone reads that book it is an authoritative account of what happened. However, it's also compromised by my ability, by the editor, by the market, all these things impact what that history is. How much does that matter to a historian who's reading this thing 500 years from now? Or when you look back 500 years ago and you look at, I don't know, what's that guy's name? Caballero, Caballero, the guy that sailed, basically um, he left Cortez and, and went east on the river and went all the way across the uh, Amazon basin. And, yeah. you know, he's writing as best he can, but come on. <laughs> It's not an yeah. easy task. And he's looking at stuff that he can't even, he's, he's struggling with the words, the nouns and verbs to even describe. And yeah. I imagine that you will face that exact same problem because how do you, how do you capture the essence of a, um, you know, a, an incoming 120 millimeter mortar round? I mean, that has a particular sound and 
there's an anticipated impact. There's all sorts of this suite of stuff that'll uh, be challenging to capture in prose. Right. So as historians, we're, we're trained, at least we used to be trained, to take a look at all of our sources critically and to weigh in the fact, well, this guy was at this particular position and he could actually see what he says he's seeing. Yeah. You know, what, what you oftentimes get is accounts by guys who are 100 miles from the, the action that they're describing. Right. And if a historian is worth their salt, then they will know how to go in there and analyze these sources. Now, I think that there's a trend in modern graduate programs for people to pick up kind of the point they're trying to make and then go farm the evidence to support their point. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was raised up in the profession in an era where you were supposed to follow your sources and let your sources tell the story. So, um, you know, there's going to be people read your account and say, this guy's, you know, he's full of caca, you know, there's no way he could have right. done that. Yeah. And then once they go back and analyze exactly what you're talking about and where you were in your vantage point, they'll say, wow, this is actually extraordinarily valuable because this guy had the lucky location in order to see it all. Yeah. And it's true because like, you know, I can say legitimately, cause I was there and I did it. I was in the army reserve. And I was in the Middle East after 9-11. I cannot prove that with any official government document. Now, that document exists somewhere. I somewhere. just I, I don't have, have it or the need to go get it, right? Sure. And so I tell these stories sometimes, and it's like I was in the Army. I was in Egypt. I was talking to Dr. Zawas every day. That was part of my job. Mm -hmm. Can't prove it. I can only tell you the story. you know. And so a lot of these things, you know, we I guess we put on faith that they actually happened. And they deserve to be questioned. And I guess with the new school of history kind of going on the same lines, we're recognizing that when we talk about the Buffalo Soldiers, we talk about Powhatan and Clark. We don't talk about the other, the actual Buffalo Soldiers very much because they weren't as prolific with their writing. And so the stories aren't there to flush out as completely. And so do we need to take some of that new school and say, hey, there were 15 black dudes around this guy. And this is how these guys lived. And this is why they made the choice to join the cavalry and everything. Sure. Or I don't know. What do we, what do we do about these legitimate things when we're like, we're not telling the full story. Yeah. And that's one of the best questions I was ever posed by a student. He said, how do you know any of this stuff happened? Mm. Which then leads you into the discussion of primary sources, secondary sources, and you know, how you source history. So back to the, um, uh, you know, how do you tell the story of the 15 non-letter writing buffalo soldiers you end up having to deal with abstractions you know here's where they're enlisted from here's what we know about where they enlisted from in the life and times in that region you know if they're ninth or tenth cavalry they're either coming from new orleans or st louis right. and so if they're coming from st louis then uh their past lives as slaves in uh missouri their enslaved reality there is different than their enslaved reality down in new orleans so you can talk about that in very abstract terms, but you don't know what's going on with each one of those guys individually unless they wrote it down or somebody wrote it down for them. So you think writing history about Buffalo soldiers is tough. Try writing it about the indigenous peoples of North America. Come on. You know, I would love to write a uh, military history of the Comanches. I think that would be a great book. Yeah. The problem is I don't have any Comanches writing down much about what they did. That's right. All you're getting is, you know, some white guy saying, hey, they came through here. They lifted this livestock. They went over that hill. With the one exception, there's actually a couple of um, accounts of uh, captives that end up writing memoirs after they're repatriated to their families, whether they like it or not. And what's interesting is when you can corroborate what they're saying with what some white guy is saying about a particular Indian encounter. And I've only run into this one time in my career, and it happened to do with a very mundane stealing of horses in Buffalo Gap, Texas, in which one of the guys stealing horses was actually a white captive that had been Comanchified. And uh, the other account was from the buffalo hunter who lost his horses. But that is a minor, tiny fraction of a tiny fraction of a tiny story uh, in the overall saga of the Comanche story. So it's it's a challenge. I mean, history is a challenging field. When we 
are trying to wash the ideology out of the history. And let's be honest, that happens. And it has always yeah. happened. There's always, always, you know, persons, bias, everything, right? Yeah. Um, but we can't pre-wash it in and expect the good history to come out. And I think that's kind of an era where we're in now. You know, like, like we talk about slaves, people yeah. intelligently talk about maybe five minutes worth of slave knowledge, and then it's gone. They don't know anything specific. I mean, we know that there were slaves on the North American continent long before 1619. Sure. But, but you know, because there were humans here. <laughs> and probably yeah. it seems like, and I, I'm in the school of, there were a lot more humans here than we can realize yet. And we're going to continue to find out they were here. Um, a man down the road here in San Diego who uh, runs the NAT, they found an elephant that has what can only really be human, you know, carving marks on it and yeah. tools next to the bone that they were carving. I, this stuff's all there. And it goes back, you ready? 100,000 years. Yeah, there's people here a lot for a lot longer than we thought. And if and they were here 100,000 years ago, they were back as far back as there were people, you know? Yeah, correct, correct. Uh, have you read the book 1491? Yes, yeah. I, yeah. I think that's a great work. And, and the idea of, was there 10 million or 100 million, you know, people here at the point of contact? Because that makes a difference. It does. But again, then we're we're leaning into anthropology. Right. And so yeah. it's, it's yeah. unknowable as a historian because these guys aren't jotting it down. Yeah. But it is, there is a lot of history. There is, it's, it, um, I don't know, it kind of fingers together, right? Where you guys, like there is, um, I don't know, I'm reading about tip and tip, you know, the, the ivory and slave trader from Africa. Yeah. We, we know that the British did a lot in the late 1800s to just stop you know, as much slavery as they could and, and to put their men out in the field, you know, Khartoum and all these different things. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, we know so much about slavery at the academic level. It doesn't seem to wash down to the, the layman level. Because we have short attention spans. Mm. And so something like the 1619 project that the New York Times put forward is really designed at people that don't have much of a base of in, basis in knowledge. They have a particular proclivity towards their interpretation. This is a nice sort of easily digestible way to feed that that pre-positioned interpretation. And it has very little to do with history. It has a lot to do with emotions and things like that. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried that we are in kind of an era of um, bumper sticker history mm. in which if it doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, we don't have the time or the stomach for it. And uh, we like everything fast. I mean, TikTok history, let's go there, you know. Yeah. Oh uh, it's um, If you're really going to get into the warp and weft of the past, it takes a little bit of uh, effort, both in the creation of it and the consumption of it. How big of a swath can a historian take? I'm not talking the greatest historians of all time, but like, like say, someone at your level where you've written a bunch of books, you definitely yeah. have a specialty. Um, you know, different guys have like, you might focus on the buttons and all the military uniforms and that's your, you know, piece of the puzzle. That's your thing. Yeah. Right. How, how wide can someone get and speak, you know, at, at an expert's level in, in something like that? I mean, the, you've got, you've got Texas wired type, but you know about a lot more history than that. Sure. Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, you, you start out at the 30,000 foot level. And then when people get into the Q&A, they'll want something specific. That's when you hit them with the specifics. Yeah. Because all those specifics are the bricks that you're building this overall historical edifice about. So, I mean, think about walking down the street and you see a, a grand structure. The first thing you notice is, man, that is a grand structure. You don't focus in and say, I bet that they got those bricks from the Bennett, Texas brick kiln you know, you just don't do that. You don't walk down the street and start counting bricks. You take it all in, and that's your first impression. And then after that, you may go say, look at the attention to detail, look at the hinges, look at the doorknob, look at the bricks. And that's essentially how history is done. So we're in the business of putting all those bricks into a grand edifice, describing our edifice, but then being able to say, oh, yeah, you know, look at this over here, how we use this sort of material to get this effect. And um, it's all a construction process. I mean, we're all just contractors at heart. <laughs> so many times you read a biography that comes along after or some other kind of history, and there's a lot of critique of the earlier versions of it because the, a new letter is found. Or, sure. Look, I mean, quite honestly, like you can go and read every single piece of paper that we have archived about World War One, 
And if you're a half-assed historian who has great access and patience to do that work, you'll get whatever kind of history that they could write, right? So um, right. Chris Thomas King is a musician, and he writes a history of the blues. And he's like, you you Upper East Coast you know, folks want the blues to be this slave-driven thing. And we know now that that's not true. Like, we know the guy who was the guy who inspired the guy who wrote about the blues. We know who the guy was and what song he was right. playing, you know? But because the guy studying it had this preconceived notion that this is this primitive form that goes back to Africa. The found, call and response out in the cotton fields, too. Yeah. Yeah. He found the evidence to, to back his conclusions, despite all of the uh, all of the evidence. Well, you know, one of the things that is going on right now is you have this this divide between revisionist and traditionalist. At least that's how the journalists have had have tried to frame the, the conversation. Mm -hmm. But I would argue that history by definition is revisionist. Because okay. like you said, you're always going to turn up a new set of letters, a new, you know, there's a trunk up in Ann Hattie's attic and inside that trunk are all the letters that actually said that, you know, Lincoln actually was an alien, you know, and here's the evidence for that or whatever. Um, but that is, uh, that's the nature of our business. And if you're honest, you say, oh, wow, I didn't have access to those, those sources. This new person did. Congratulations on their discovery. It helps advance the story. Uh, it's the folks that say, no, this is the story. This is the only story. And if you don't accept my story, you're the enemy. That's the problem. I mean, that's a big problem. We make these decisions to back <laughs> a state or, or, um, uh, in histories, like we go back and we look at, let me see here, uh, Robert E. Lee's, uh, biography written by Douglas South, multi-volume Douglas, Douglas South of Freeman's thing, it's been, you know, it's been pushed along and, and changed. There's a brand new one by, by another very notable historian. And, and we look at, we struggle with Robert E. Lee because he's like, I'm going to back, I'm going to back Virginia because that's where I'm from. Right. And then because he has this man of character and moral and he's a highly regarded officer, he now has this stain on him. And yet there are people from the North who made the same decision. This is, you know, this is a state thing. I'm going because mine from New York and this is the direction I go. So we're trying to still figure out Robert E. Lee, and he's been dead for, gosh, 130 years or something like that now. The Marble Man. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. You know, and with yeah. my accent, I have to really enunciate the Marble Man, or people think I'm talking about the Marlboro Man. Marlboro Man, yeah. Yeah, yeah the Marlboro yeah. Man. Um, no, it, it's, it's pretty critical uh, that everybody goes into it with an open and honest mind, frankly. Uh Clearly, Douglas Southall Freeman's writing about Robert E. Lee at a time period that's kind of the Moonlight and Magnolia school. You know, he is the most noble human being, the best example of American nobility that has ever, uh, ever lived. Um, and then other people say, no, he's an evil, terrible slave owner, and we need to take his uh, statue down and cast it into bullets or whatever. Yeah. Um, so somewhere in the middle lies the truth, I'm sure. Uh, just like all human endeavors, uh, you've got to take input from both sides. Now, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, if you were to speak ill of Robert E. Lee, then all of a sudden you were a bad guy. You know, mm. Robert E. Lee was the acceptable Southerner. So it was not unusual, for instance, in one-room schoolhouses in Texas in the late 19th, early 20th century to see a picture of George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Robert E. Lee. And so, well, how can you have Lincoln and Lee in the same room? Because it was to, it was speaking to a higher American ideal. Mm. Now, what you didn't see was George Washington and George Washington Carver or Marcus Garvey or Sitting Bull. So as Americans and as uh, historians, when we're trying to tell this story to the next generation, we have to start taking samples and holding people up as uh, a particular um, example of what we're trying to press press home. So all over the country, we have Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, and he pertains more to certain parts of the country than others. Right. Great. He's a lot more universal than, say, Cesar Chavez. So there's a big uh, boulevard through uh, Austin, Texas, Cesar Chavez Boulevard. He's an incredibly important guy in California history, right. Right. less so in Texas history. In fact, I would argue there's probably better examples from Texas, but um, for naming a, a, a street for a Hispanic leader, a Tejano leader, 
that was pushing for um, civil liberties and um, just rights uh, for the Tejanos. So why do we bring, why do we import this Californian? <laughs> and the, the reason being is because he's the guy, you know, that's what everybody yeah. settled on, that he's our example. And it's too hard to explain some new guy. You know, we've already got his bio written. It's on Wikipedia. We can refer people to Cesar Chavez as opposed to, you know, Antonio Garcia or somebody else. And so uh, fu history funny that way in, <laughs> in how we focus, how we land on particular names. And then those becomes the names that we push forward at the expense of other names that might have told a better story. They're just uh, not the ones that make the cut. I, I guess it's like casting a movie in our head. You know, mm. some people you cast because you like the fact that they have these color eyes and this cut, this style of hair, and they're this tall and, you know, this muscular or whatever. Yeah, I'm thinking about that. When I moved to Chicago after being in the Army, I, I got a day off. And I'm like, why do we have a day off today? And like, oh, it's Pulaski Day. And I'm like, who the, I'm from California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know who the hell this polish guy is you know and they have yeah. a whole damn day off and it's it's not just illinois it's there's schools named after this guy i literally had never ever heard of this person at all you know and 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 here is this massive historic figure if you're east of the mississippi and north of gosh i don't know probably the mason dixon line you know he matters yeah. so much you know yeah the only pulaski i know is fort pulaski down in uh georgia and right. so I'm assuming it's the same guy, but I don't know. Right. It is the same I have guy. no idea. He's this but I imagine yeah. if I had to put that together, I imagine it is the same guy. And because of the large Polish uh, population in Chicago that they said Pulaski's our guy. Yeah. Yeah. So back to the original question, then who are some yeah. of these forgotten people, forgotten stories, forgotten battles? I just learned recently that there was a battle, um, off of Cherbourg in the Civil War. Now I'm like, wait, the Civil War was also fought in the waters off of France. You know, like, oh, absolutely. You know, <laughs> fought in the in the uh, waters off the, of the Bering Sea. I mean, yeah. it was the Confederate raider Shenandoah that wiped out the uh, New England whaling fleet, but finally put the final nails in its coffin, and they wrecked somewhere in the neighborhood better than two dozen whaling ships up there in the Bering Sea. There's a great painting of the Shenandoah in the foreground, the background. You see these just piles of smoke going up in the air from all the burning whalers uh so yeah there's there's so many of these interesting sort of side stories these rabbit holes you can fall down uh, and in in texas you know there's there's no exception i'm thinking uh in particular like Britt johnson the Britt johnson story is one of the most compelling from texas history and this is a guy that was an enslaved man at the time of the civil war comanches and Kyle was coming and steal his family kill a couple of them and Britt Johnson goes to his uh, owner and says, look, I got to go find my family. And uh, the owner says, I've got X amount of gold. Take half of it. You go find your people. You're free. Go oh, get after it. And that is such a, a an interesting story that is a uh, that really does a nice job of capturing that intersection of native peoples, uh, the enslaved and now the the liberated and the enslaver and now the emancipator all in one sort of story. And yet we don't talk much about Britt Johnson and we yeah. don't use that as a, uh, uh, I do, but <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. he's not mainstream is all I'm saying. Uh, and then I supposedly there was a um, connection between the Britt Johnson story and John Wayne's the searchers. But of course, in order to make the movie, everybody was white in that movie. Yeah. But if they were to do the Britt Johnson story well, that would be the most multi-ethnic, multicultural, compelling story you could come across because you've got Indians helping him find his family. You've got Indians that are busy stealing his family, trying to sell them. You've got white guys that are trying to oppose him finding his family. You've got white guys that are helping him. And so it's a, really a human story that transcends race and uh, culture. So great story there. You know, I'd leave that with you. My New Year's gift to you. Uh, perhaps you can do the screenplay on that. The, yeah, uh, needs, I love it. He, now, my own personal favorite, I like Tom Green. He's been the guy that's been central uh, uh, to most of my research. And the thing I like about Tom Green is he is a Texan of his particular age. 
so he first comes to Texas during the uh, America uh, during the uh, Texas War for Independence, fights at the Battle of San Jacinto, goes back home, finishes college. You know, what did you do on you know summer break? Oh, I went to the Battle of San Jacinto, and then I came back and finished my degree. Then he comes to Texas, gets his land bounty, and ends up becoming kind of a, a big deal in the antebellum period. Fights in the war with Mexico, fights against Comanches. Um, but when the Civil War rolls around, he's getting a little long in the tooth. He's nearly 50. And so uh, he uh, is at, uh, essentially, he has this burden, this burden of being this Texas representative type of the man of action, the person who can lead in dire circumstances, who's not afraid of smelling gunpowder and the, the whiz of the bullet and the fleck of the arrow. You know, this is him. But now there's this new crisis upon them. And what do you do, Tom? You're 50. And war is kind of a young man's sport. I mean, we don't have air-conditioned bunks uh, like we do now. I mean, it's you're underneath a tree, and you're going to come back with the rheumatism and chronic uh, dysentery. It's going to be hard on an old man in 50s old in 1861. Even so, he tells his dad that I will go. Uh, if I know with certainty that I will fall in the first volley. And he explains himself. He says, the issues are fresher with us than they will be with our children. So therefore, I'm compelled to leave them a name that they can be proud of. So this guy's acting out of principle. You may not agree with his principles, but he's acting out of a particular mindset. And it, it makes for a fascinating story to me. Struggles with alcoholism. And that comes through in some of the letters and some of the accounts. So there's a real human element to that. Interesting guy. They almost made him governor of Texas at one time. But uh, anyhow, he ends up catching a cannonball in the forehead before the end of the war. So it's a very shortened biography. He's yeah. not like one of these guys that lives until he's 100 and the book ends up being, you know, 5,000 pages. I, I was a big fan of Rufus Fears and his history, you know, and, and he's a storyteller yeah. for sure. And oh, yeah. He would talk about a man of destiny, you know, and once you find that destiny, you're done. You know, like once you've – Lewis and Clark were men of destiny, and it doesn't end so well for at least one of those guys. Yeah, no um, kidding. Guys we've discussed in this, you know, in this thing, Powhatan and Clark does incredible stuff during the uh, Apache Wars, dead at 32. Um, uh, Will Cushing, you know – an old man at 32 because he had just, you know, warriored his body to pieces, you know, warriored so his guys... body to pieces. Have you yeah. ever run across the story of uh, Grigny? No. In, uh -uh. Uh, connected with the uh, invasion of Normandy? No, no. Uh, uh, it's a great story. It's one of them I discovered when I was leading tours over there. Uh, so, you know, the, when they dropped the paratroops into Normandy, a bunch of them missed their mark. And one particular group, I think it's part of the 507th Parachute Infantry Regiment, the headquarters company gets dropped 20 miles behind German lines. Mm -hmm. And so they get dumped out in the middle of this big marae, big swamp, marshy area, and they all kind of cluster up on the village that's in the middle of this swamp. And then they have to come up with a plan on, you know, how they start the war from there when they have, they actually have a 30 caliber machine gun for every two people. They've they had all the extra gear dropped in and they also had a bunch of telephone wire and they also had a bunch of typewriters, you know, that yeah. sort of stuff. But they end up making this uh, very interesting heroic stand and they're helped in this by the citizens of the town. I mean, they take care of their wounded, they feed them, they run messages for them. It's a great story that emerges from the battle for Normandy, really the landings at the, the Norman beaches in the, airborne operations related to it but one that is never really folded into the the mainstream of that narrative now i'm pretty convinced that tom hanks uh in uh saving private ryan knew something about grogne because there is so much of that final scene where they're you know fighting in this village that's a long way behind german lines that mirrors what happened in reality mm -hmm. But uh, for me to discover something about the battle uh, of the invasion of Normandy that I didn't know before, I found, ex you know, very exciting and very compelling. And that I love those stories that have been hinted at, 
or you can see where they fit into the larger story, but they just ended up on the editing room floor, as they say. Yeah. So that's one of my faves. Uh, while we're talking about favorites, I'm going to put a link up for a book by Jim D. Felice. I don't know if you know Jim's work, but Jim Jim does a lot of writing as well. He wrote about the Pony Express, just a fantastic, I guess we call it biography of it. And one of the things about the Pony Express, I never realized 18 months start to finish. That's it. And yet it <laughs> sticks with us so powerfully. You know, anyhow, his story, World War II, he found a guy named Henry Long Rare, guy still with us. He's a paratrooper. He jumps in. He jumps into the scene. You know, when Red Buttons is hanging from the uh, steeple at the church? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Henry is like the guy, next guy to him in the airplane. So he's like, yeah, I look up and I see Ricky. And I'm like, oh, shoot, Ricky's up there. I got to get out of here because we're not where we're supposed to be, you know? And then his story from that point forward is just like a first-person shooter video game. Like, they should just yeah. take it and just script the whole thing out. He... He has to kill a lady because it's one of the two of them is going to die. You know, he ends up, uh, he, he shoots a tank and kills that. He ends up in a prisoner camp. He escapes with another, I mean, Don, it's a crazy, it's, so it's called Whatever It Takes. It's a story of Henry Longrare. And I've got, a, I've had him on the show, just incredible. And you hear all these things and this guy's like, I didn't do that much. I just did my part. <laughs> like, Which you, is true. But <laughs> their part was kind of badass. I mean, it was kind of important. Yeah. 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 And that's, he, that's the thing. These guys are also humble. You know, well, what about this guy that actually got killed? And what about this guy who, you know, took out that position before they got him? Right. All of that is true. But it doesn't minimize what their own experience was. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I want to ask you about Texas because... Yeah. Texas, you know, don't mess with Texas. Everybody has a big star on their fence. There's a lot of pride in Texas. Flag probably, in the background. Yeah. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> it's one of the most pride-filled states. I mean, to be there and and uh, there's tons of people wanting to go there, Re really immigrating there. It really is the best way to say it because they're yeah. leaving something for the opportunity in Texas. But that hasn't always been what Texas is. So, so what is Texas? What was Texas 150 years ago? And when did Texas begin? You know, like as yeah. an idea. Well, Texas, you know, 150, 200 years ago was heaven for men and dogs and hell for women and horses. Mm -hmm. That's the old saying about Texas. In fact, uh, one uh, federal officer, Phil Sheridan, when he came to occupy Texas after the Civil War, said, my God, if I owned hell and I owned Texas, I'd live in hell and rent out Texas. <laughs> so <laughs> it is an acquired taste and it was an acquired taste historically. Uh, the terrain here is pretty unforgiving. As I tell audiences whenever I'm asked to speak, there's only one natural body of fresh water in Texas. Every other lake you fly over in Texas is man-made. Wow. And the only the only uh, naturally, naturally occurring lake in Texas is Caddo Lake. And we have to share it with Louisiana. And so that's kind of embarrassing too. Uh, so it's it is a rough neighborhood. And it's also a rough neighborhood because it's the scene of three major cultures, both the Spanish Empire, the American Empire and its predecessors, and then the Comanche Empire. Hmm. And so it is the kind of place where you'd better pack some water and you'd better pack a sandwich if you're going anywhere. And then you'd better always have somebody covering your six because death comes swiftly and unexpectedly in those days. So how do you take that howling wilderness full of people that mean you harm and turn it into one of the most dynamic places in uh, the United States and in the, on the planet today. I mean, by 2050, we're going to double the population of this state. And a bunch of them are Californians, and a bunch of them are coming from California uh, claiming to be political refugees, which is an interesting phenomena, too. So, you know, why? how did Texas become Texas? And I, I would argue that Texas is perhaps the best expression of the American ideal. That was first formulated in the halls of Independence Hall in Philadelphia, uh, in those chambers and those smoke filled rooms. Was they're busy trying to figure out what kind of nation are we forming? Uh, I oftentimes look at, and more often than not, look at the Constitution as being as much a commercial document as it is a um, political document. Mm -hmm. I see it almost as articles of incorporation <laughs> as much as it is, you know, articles of uh, how we're going to govern ourselves. Right. And to me, what they were really hitting at was let's build a scaffolding and a rule book that allows people to pursue their happiness. 
And in Texas, we take that very, very seriously. The, the pursuit of your happiness is kind of an important thing for us. And government's role is to facilitate you pursuing your happiness. Now, does Texas have all the public services of other states? No, we don't. And if you find yourself needing to rely on public services, you may be a little frustrated. But that is coming along with that idea of being self-sufficient, that you need to take care of business, you need to be responsible for yourself. And if you take care of business, you're responsible for yourself, and then things happen to you outside of your own ability to handle it, there's probably some way for us to address it publicly or socially um, as some sort of public service. But by and large, those are, those are yielded sparingly uh, as compared to other states. So there's a downside, certainly. But the upside is if you've got ambition and you want to go and do things in a level playing field with a, about, without a whole lot of people standing on your, your toes while you're doing it, Texas is the place to do it. And a lot of people are realizing that and they're moving here, which means they're drinking our water, which will be the next big crisis. <laughs> when we run out of water, that's going to be a big issue. See your earlier comment about all those man-made lakes. Yeah, yeah. So what was the time? When was the time before Texas? I mean, obviously people lived in Candelaria for thousands of years. We're not talking about sure. that. But we're talking about when was the dawn of Texas and what happened to make that idea, that thing happen? All right. I would say that probably uh, you have the heroic age, which is the Texas Revolution and all that, but it really doesn't stick. You know, mm -hmm. one of the things a friend of mine did a lot of work on the um, vexology of the uh, Texas flag. You know, when did the Texas flag become a thing? And apparently by 1861, secessionists were trying to figure out what the original Texas flag looked like and they couldn't remember just 15 years ago. Right. So a bunch of the, the, the trappings of Texas that we have today are kind of manufactured after the fact. Okay. So a little ex post facto going on here. Yeah. And uh, what ends up happening is two things in the early 20th century that manufacture modern Texas. So, well, there's three things. So the Civil War does a lot to create Texas culture. And by that, I mean the political landscape and the cultural landscape we're suspicious of too much government. That's why we have a part-time legislature. We don't trust um, the, uh, the federal government. We see that there's a lot of overreach coming from Washington. So we're a 10th Amendment state. Uh, we, we tend to protect our state prerogatives uh, and state jurisdictions. So all that's a result of the Civil War. But even so, until 1900, 1901, we're just a really big Alabama. In a lot of ways, you know, we got chicken coops in the back. We're still chopping cotton. You know, you could go here, you could go to Mobile or you could go to Montgomery and see kind of the same thing going on. Uh, it's the discovery of oil. Pen, spindle top changes everything because now all of a sudden we're Alabama with a lot of money. And that leads to a lot of resentment because there are places like New York City, Boston, increasingly California, but not quite yet. Uh, where there's old money there and they're used to calling the shots. And then all of a sudden there's this infusion of the nouveau riche uh, that just sets everybody's teeth on edge. Edna Ferber wrote her book, Giant, poking fun at all these outrageous Texas characters. And Texans all said, my gosh, she captured us. You know, we are outrageous. We are, you know, <laughs> these kind of uh, folks. So I'd say the discovery of oil uh, starts that trajectory, and then it gets celebrated with the big 100-year anniversary with the Texas Centennial in 1936. And that's when Texas says, hello, world, here we are, and we're throwing a great big party, and here's why we're awesome. And everything's draped in the state flag, and the Lone Star is ubiquitous. Um, in between Spindletop and the, uh, uh, the Centennial, uh, the Alamo is uh, turned into a shrine of Texas liberty. That's kind of a stepping stone to this. And I think that there is a, a manufacturing of this sort of modern Texas uh, symbology, uh, this sort of Texas um, uh, intellectual cultural landscape that happens in the early 20th century. So one of the things that's going to be the big challenge, and that's actually one of the things I'm working on now at the Texas Center here at Shriner University, is how do you uh, do something called cultural sustainability? So if, if Texas is a 10th Amendment state, 
that believes people should be free to pursue their happiness. How do you maintain that when you're also welcoming the rest of the nation and the rest of the world to move here and pursue their happiness? How do you get somebody to find their part of that Texas story? You know what the the third uh, most frequently spoken language is in Texas? You know, English and Spanish, that's easy. What's number three? English? That's what I would guess, honestly. (laughs) It's actually Vietnamese. Oh, no Vietnam. kidding. Okay. Yeah, okay. Vietnamese okay. comes next, and then uh, uh, Mandarin comes, and then after that, it's Tagalog. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. you've got mm-hmm. uh, that tells you that you have a lot of immigration from Asia going on in Texas. You know, yeah. clearly you got immigration from Guatemala and Mexico. Sure. Uh, and so we we constantly have conversations about well, where what's their Texas story when the Alamo is kind of the big deal. Uh, but ask somebody that's a Vietnamese shrimper from Rockport. You know, where is your Texas story and how do you fit into this sort of Texasosity, this heroic age, and then this early 20th century Texas hoorah? Uh, that's that's going to be an important question to answer. And that's kind of what I've set my uh, uh, hat to do, <laughs> uh, like try it. to help everybody that's coming here find their place in the story. But really, in terms of history, Texas is brand spanking new. It is. It is. And uh, the thing that I think the technique I'm going to use is that Texas is predicated or dedicated to a proposition, (laughs) you know, just like Mm -hmm. Abraham Lincoln said in the uh, Gettysburg Address. Um, And so, you know, if we're dedicated to a proposition, what is this Texas proposition? And that Texas proposition is that, hey, you ought to be able to pursue your happiness. Government has a role to support that pursuit. And I think that if you, uh, brace it in those terms, those economic terms, but also the idea of of liberty and freedom and the ability to uh, achieve uh, human potential without people getting in your way. I think that, that that speaks to people from Guatemala. It speaks to people from Tajikistan, speaks to people that are fresh in from Egypt. I mean, that human yearning to reach your full potential is a universal human thing. And that's and what that we is- try to do here. That is why you come to the U.S. I've heard that so many times from from fairly new immigrant folks. You know, I could not do what I'm doing here where I was from. So I left my fatherland, motherland, whatever it is. Yeah. They came here. And that's that's what we lose track of how remarkable that is. I wanted to ask you another thing. I've been fascinated uh, recently with the um, the Spanish missions that, oh, yeah. that are all over the southwestern states and, and, and you know, it's funny, we often discover these things in history. We're like, why didn't I learn this? Well, because yeah. there's a lot of history, right? And you're also jit-jacking in the back of the room trying to make time with the girl next to you. Oh, please. Yeah, <laughs> nonstop. That's what's more important, the future history of yeah, me yeah, and that yeah. girl. Yeah, the absolutely. teacher's just up there going, wah, 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 yeah. wah. Yeah. I, so I just learned that there are, so, you know, in California, we're taught about the missions and it's really basic stuff, everything, but it stops at San Diego. And no, it does not. It goes south all the way down Baja. Yeah. And by the way, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and it's, you know, and then you'd have to understand that it's Franciscan, it's Dominican, it's Jesuit history as yep. well. And their impact on our region of the nation is um, there are so many things that we do and say and see and everything else, our architecture, everything is driven by these people that are really proto-Texans, proto-Californians. Yeah. And and not only that, but they're heavily influenced in their architectural styles and the way that they organize themselves by an Arab occupation of the yep. Iberian Peninsula that went on for a few centuries, yeah. you know, many more centuries than we've been around as a country. So, you know, it's a uh, it, it's interesting when you take a look at that and then start breaking it into well, the Jesuits ran their operations this way and the right. Franciscans ran it this way. And if you're at a Jesuit mission, this might've been your experience, Franciscan, this one. Yeah. And so uh, when you take a look at what the Spanish were trying to do with all these missions, which was essentially create culture factories, leave your old culture, turn you into a new culture and take on the new trappings of this new culture so that you can be a tax-paying citizen of the Spanish Empire. Then you start to figure out, ah, well, is there anything that going on today? Hmm, maybe what public school is. <laughs> you know, maybe that's what we're doing yeah. at universities. I mean, they're all culture yeah. factories. Maybe that's what Hollywood is. It is it's essentially a great purveyor of uh, a particular worldview that they want people to buy into. 
Yep. So uh, when you go by the old mission in California, man, and then you go by the Warner Brothers lot in L.A., huh, there might be some things that are very common yeah. between these two sites. Yeah, that's so that's so true. You know, um, in my hometown is one of the oldest. If, I don't know, like depends on how they draw the circle and everything. It's one of the oldest Catholic churches. It's called St. Dominic's, and it goes back to 1849, maybe something okay. like that. So it's pretty old. I mean, it's as old as as things are in terms of of that kind of structure in the Western states, and uh, it's still there. It's still doing its job. And and there's a mission somewhere kind of in our area, but not really close to us. So you also have these churches that are interconnecting and doing that cultural thing. And uh, definitely it's different because we have a large, in my hometown, it used to be the state capital of, of, of California for a while too. And you have a strong Portuguese foundation, obviously a strong uh, Mexican Spanish heritage. You know, you have all these things. It was a military town grant and, and um, uh, a whole bunch of other people served there, right? They have very notable people. And so you have this thing, we have all these things mixed together, but there's that Catholic church as kind of the, the bellwether or, or the, you know, the, the lighthouse that, that we all could go there to worship. And there wasn't a whole lot of Lutherans around and that kind of thing. Sure. And, and the Catholic church is built around the idea of order. Yeah. And order is, um, a, an orderly society is a polite society that's easy to police. And so if you can get everybody going to church, everybody saying the same thing at the same time, standing up when they're supposed to, kneeling when they're supposed to, going through the rituals together, yeah. that actually builds a very nice fabric for society that makes society a lot more productive and predictable. It's uh, when you throw in all these frontier Protestants, man, and the Methodists are doing it one way and the Baptists are doing it another way, and my gosh, the Church of Christ don't act like anybody else is here, you know, then it becomes just some sort of chaos. But it's that sort of um, creative chaos that is actually an American genius, I would argue. So yeah. but those missions were essentially trying to create predictability and stability. And you may not agree with the, the tactics that they were employing. And I know there's people that have pushed back against missions as essentially being agents of um, genocide. And if not literal genocide, then certainly cultural genocide. But different time, different place, different objectives, different people. And um, I'm not sure I would uh, favor the Aztecs over a Jesuit. But well. <laughs> some, people might, some, might, some people might argue that point. Yeah, they might. They might. You certainly can, can pick something else. That, that is another good point, too. As you look back through history, humans have always been bad at humanity. I mean, uh, we, we're terrible. We're despicable <laughs> humans. Yeah, like I was, someone was telling me about some atrocity I didn't know about where one people killed another people. It doesn't matter because it's, it's the story of humanity. And yeah. I'm like, 13? Come on. <laughs> like, that's, that's, that's nothing. I mean, let's just. I mean, how many different examples are there? Hundreds or thousands or millions of people that are either, you know, decimated or completely eliminated. I mean, how, how many uh, how many Carthaginians are still alive? You know, <laughs> we were having a debate here at the Texas Center. Just one of those things you do is you're eating lunch and kind of yeah. ruminating on um, who actually, you know, which civilization or which particular world leader was responsible for more human death than any other. And I was voting for Tamerlane. Somebody else was for Genghis Khan. Turns out Genghis Khan probably wins wins the honor uh, in terms of uh, not necessarily per, um, in raw numbers, but certainly per capita. Okay. And so uh, it's it's interesting. But all of this reminds me of my golf game. Mm. About the time you know I shoot a pretty consistent one forty four. <laughs> which means I'm a terrible golfer. Yes, it does. And about the time I'm ready to, you know, chunk the, the clubs into the pond and be done with it, you know, you'll drive the green. Yeah. And you'll go, man, this is a great game. Yeah. And so about the time you lose faith in humanity, there'll be these stories of just selfless devotion and love for fellow man, fellow humankind that are just astounding. And that's when you start to understand the mind of God. Okay, if you can show me a handful of righteous people, I won't kill you all. And so, uh, you know, that's that's kind of what keeps me keeps me in the history game. Is every now and then you'll find that story that goes, "Man, if I could only be that good." Yeah, 
I was at the World War One Museum, and anybody who hasn't been, you guys got to go. It's such a powerful. It's it's such a it's a beautiful, beautiful place. That's the one in Independence, Missouri, or Kansas City. The Kansas City one, yeah, 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 just incredible. And I was talking to one of the people there, you know, doing a show, and you know, I said, "Hey, there's this place is full of stories that are never going to get told. What are some of your favorites?" And she talked about she didn't talk about war. She talked about the love stories, the impossible love stories that happened because some dude from Australia got blown up in a place where a nurse from Ireland came, you know, and and they stay in love and they ride across nations and everything else. I mean, these are the incredible things people write about. And that goes to your whole humanity thing. There is a lot of beauty in humanity. You know, in between our atrocity, there's a lot of, of that of that good. Well, sometimes the atrocities are the very bright white light that illuminates those little sparks of humanity. There's so much shadow because of this bright white light. And then all of a sudden there'll be a spark and there's a spark and you're like, okay, okay. Maybe we're not all depraved. Maybe we're not beyond all redemption. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. (laughs) Maybe You've seen a lot worse stuff than I have. So, I mean, you're probably coming at it from a different angle. (laughs) There's a lot of beauty that, you know, yeah, there's, there's, you have to have all of it right to have, otherwise you don't, you just have this up, up, up line and and that ain't no fun. We got to have some, some cosine action. Um, All right. So I want to wrap this up. Everybody look, Don writes incredible histories and he's great. They're all bloody bloody this bloody that it's because the southwest is just full of chaos and it's amazing that anybody survived in that place and and got along but don's a great guest and you can check him out there you can also go into the show notes you'll see him by the way the show is supported by you all so go to the paypal link and go to breakitdownshow.com click the paypal link and just put a little bit of money in the pocket each month that money goes to help fund the show the more, and that's what 2022 is about for me is, is uh, getting more people to sign up and put in, look, $5 a month, $10 a month, whatever it is. For sure, support Don, get his books. For sure, sort and support the Break It Down show. Let me know who you want to hear from. And Don, thank you again so much. Anything in closing? I always enjoy these conversations. It's, uh, you know, there's a line from Lonesome Dove, nothing better than riding a good horse through a new country. And for me, there's nothing better than having a great conversation with somebody who appreciates history. So thanks for the opportunity.